views expressed on this program are those of the hosts, guests, and callers, and are not necessarily those of this station, its management, or other advertisers. You're listening to Transformation Talk Radio. On the cutting edge of the new mainstream, Christine Upchurch is passionate about bringing together science, psychology, and spirituality in a way that can be applied to our everyday lives for true transformation. The Christine Upchurch Show, stellar conversations to illuminate your journey, engages some of the most inspired visionaries on the planet in lighthearted, lively dialogue. Join us as we explore the expansive nature of reality in a down-to-earth way, offering you insights and tools, empowering you to become that bright light you're meant to be. Now, here's your host, Christine Upchurch. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Christine F. Church Show, where we have stellar conversations to illuminate your journey. Uh, I'm speaking to you today from the Seattle area. Uh, You might be listening here on KKNW AM 1150 radio. You might be listening in Connecticut, Rhode Island, or New York on WBLQ AM 1230 radio on one of the 35 stations in Australia or anywhere around the world on Transformation Talk Radio. But wherever you're joining us from today, uh, I'm so glad you, you are here because we are going to be talking about how you can shift things in your, in your body and your mind to heal and to heal a variety of things. Um, but before we get into that, I want to say hello to my better half in the studio who allows you to hear these wonderful conversations, Mr. Benny Mathers. Good morning, Benny. Uh, hello there, and I uh, hope everything's uh, going well for you. I'm doing awesome, and uh, we're trying to drain things out down here, so to speak. So. <laughs> yeah, I know. It was crazy, wasn't it? It was. Uh, I, I From the previous show, I kind of discussed how I was kind of bailing myself out of my own house that had kind of – the gutters had run over th- quite – often last night and I was a little panicky just because I had to clean them out quickly and or actually had to rip a section off so I could save my wow. garage. Yeah, it was pretty, it was a wild, oh. wild day down here yesterday and last night. Oh dear. Yeah. Oh dear. Yeah. Well, um, I'm grateful today that it's, uh, the weather has shifted. Yeah. And I'm grateful to be here. <laughs> yeah. and, and I'm grateful to have our guest today, yeah. um, Dr. Henry Grayson, He's a psychologist who's been lecturing, teaching, and providing professional training for more than three decades. Um, He's the founder of Synergetic Therapy Institute, co-chairman of of the PTSD division of the Stand for the Troops Foundation, and he has spent a lot of time, energy, um, reaching out to, to help people in a variety of ways to help them to shift their inner voice, tap into their body's wisdom, and their inner wisdom to improve health and general well-being. He is the author of a couple of different books. One is called Use Your Body to Heal Your Mind. And most recently, his new book is called Your Power to Heal, Resolving Psychological Barriers to Your Physical Health. I'd like to welcome to our show Dr. Henry Grayson. Hi, Henry. Welcome. Well, thank you. Good to be with you. You know, um, I, I I love this book. It's it's um, different in a variety of ways. We'll we'll talk about that in a little while. But I'd like to know what has ever inspired you to um, take this approach of figuring out what the connection is between the mind and the emotions and the body. Well, that's a good question to ask because it started out of my personal experience way back when I was in graduate school in Boston. Uh-huh. Uh huh. It was a very cold day in the winter up there, and we have some cold weather in Massachusetts, as you know. It's right. uh, snowing like crazy, 20 mile an hour wind. It must have been about 15, 20 degrees. And I was out in the yard repairing a fence because I had a German Shepherd dog that was growing up and was getting out. Uh-huh. So I had to repair it. And I started to get a sore throat. And I said, you know, in my best English at that time, oh, damn. Mm-hmm. And I thought, right. what was this about? And then I realized, I was supposed to be, I'd, I'd say for the last 10 years before, I always got horrible sore throat colds, probably three or four times a year. It always started as a sore throat. It always went to this debilitating uh, cold and was mm-hmm. quite difficult. And why I was upset then, I had to take comprehensive exams in about two days. Uh-huh. And so that's why I was so upset about it. And then suddenly I realized, wait a minute. I talked to a professor into doing a directed study on the mind-body research at that time. Uh-huh. Not a whole lot was out, but they thought that, and I, I discovered from that, they thought the mind-body was connected more with, say, stomach problems, ulcers, asthma, skin disorders, maybe just uh-huh. a handful of things. Well, as I stood there in that horrible snowstorm with my sore throat beginning, 
I said, wait, that, that doesn't make sense. How uh -huh. could the mind be involved in three or four or five parts of the body and not the others? Yeah. Why would it be just those segmented parts? I said, that does not make sense to me. Uh -huh. And so with that, I started to ask myself some questions. You know, why might I need this cold? Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, maybe it's trying to get me out of taking comprehensive exams. I thought, no, <laughs> that's not it. Uh, because I've already 95% prepared. I just need a little brushing up, and I've been spending weekends studying like crazy, and I'm looking forward to having my weekends free to play and have fun with my friends and family and so on. So I wanted to get it behind me. So right. I thought, well, what is it then? Uh, would it get me out of something? That, I said, no. Would it get something for me? Couldn't think of anything. Is there some emotion being expressed in it? And then suddenly I felt a big pang of guilt. And with that, I thought, wow, something's going on here. And I saw my neighbor looking out of her kitchen window over my backyard where I was doing the work. Uh -huh. And I suddenly realized I thought she was thinking, seeing here's Henry out in his backyard in this horrible weather doing something for his dog when he's not yet done what he said he was going to do for my father. Oh. And then I realized, wow, you know, I don't know what she's thinking, or if she's even seeing me, or if she's thinking mm -hmm. anything about me. It's the first time I realized how much we humans project. Right. And then I realized, I'm not trying to get out of doing this work. I know I always keep my word when I make a commitment. I'm going mm -hmm. to go over and move this furniture for her father on Tuesday after taking Sam's on Monday. And so I know it's not that issue. But I realized I was projecting guilt onto her. Right. Some of statement that would make me feel guilty. And I thought, it must be that feeling of guilt going into my body, starting this problem. And I thought, well, how would I prefer to deal with it rather than getting sick? And I thought, well, just to cement it in my own mind, as soon as I finish the work, I'll go in the house and pick up the phone, give her a call, say, I just want you to know I've not forgotten your father, I'm taking comps tomorrow, I'll be over on Tuesday, and uh, look forward to doing the work then. You know, once uh -huh. I made the commitment to deal with my guilt feeling differently, right. that I knew I was going to let go, Within about 20 minutes, my sore throat was totally gone. It's wow. been decades now, and I've never had another full-blown cold again since. That's amazing. And I have I two or three or four times a year. And I thought, wow, and why is that so? Not just because I did it that one time, because uh -huh. I learned what to do that time that I kept doing. Right. That I'd start to get the first beginnings of a symptom. I'd ask myself those questions, and since then I've added several more to be more thorough. But I'd ask myself those questions, find an alternate way of dealing with that issue rather than paying the price of the symptom. And then uh, I find I don't need the symptom anymore. That's, so that's, that's really what started story. off thinking that inspired this book. And it, it's funny, Henry, that you're talking about um, some of the questions you went through. When I was in graduate school working on my doctorate in mathematical statistics, I ended up getting the early stages of cancer. And doctors ah. had nothing to offer me at that time. Um, right. And it was a it was about a year long process when I was doing all this sort of inner um, exploration. But one of the things I came to realize is, despite the fact that I had gotten through all my comps and and I had a good portion of my research done, all my coursework done, I wasn't happy. And at one point, somebody asked me, um, "Are you planning on finishing your dissertation?" I said, "I'm going to finish my dissertation if it kills me." And then I realized uh, <laughs> that interesting you know, word. When I, I know, and when and I realized on some level it was, and in fact, when I was growing up, um, you know, it, to, to not have to go to school, you know, basically a, a sore throat would do it, a, you know, a stomach ache. Um, but to get out of graduate school, you need something much bigger than that. And I recognized that I had a reason um, for creating the cancer. And, you know, I did a lot of inner work and eventually it disappeared without any medical treatment. So it was, it's funny that, that you're aha moment was within the context of, of your graduate program, and so was mine. Yeah, and then th the interesting thing was, because I think we all, of us humans, we have what I call the human ego, is that part of us that thinks we're little and we're separate, rather than uh -huh. we're part of the unified field, as the physicists call it. We're right. part of that oneness, we're part of that power of the universe. But the two things we human beings chase after most, I think, are the two things we disown in ourselves, and what's love that? and power. And we ah. think they're both outside. And so we try to find the love in somebody else, the power in something else outside. And mm -hmm. so that permeates our whole culture. Well, anyway, I, I was uh, about, I'd say, maybe 15 years later, I started to get back trouble. And it got okay. worse, and it got worse, and it got worse. Until finally, it was, 
I tried chiropractic and I tried all sorts of other external things. Sure. And none of it really helped. One day it was so bad I could not move at all. The, the x-rays the doctor had taken says, I think you have such a severely degenerated disc, you probably won't walk again without back surgery. Oh, my goodness. And I couldn't move a centimeter. It was pain, huge pain. And then suddenly, in desperation, realizing I didn't want back surgery because at that point, uh, 6 to 8% of the time, you were worse off afterwards. Duh, okay. did I want that? <laughs> Take that kind of chance? Yeah. And so I thought, no way. And then I remembered, well, what did I do with the coals? That worked. Would that work for my back, too? Right. <laughs> it took me 15 years to remember that I could do the same thing with a serious problem like the degenerative disc. So, so I asked with, myself with that them. question and a few more. Why might I need this? What would it get me out of? What would it get mm -hmm. for me? Uh, what emotion be expressed in it? And again, it turned out to be uh, several emotions. And then mm -hmm. also uh, what trauma might be in it. And I realized I had traumas with two different individuals. One friend I felt kind of betrayed by and somebody else I felt some abandonment with. Uh -huh. And then I also realized that there are a couple of lifestyle changes I needed to make. I'd always done a lot of sports and did running in Central Park, and, but I never uh -huh. did any stretching. So I need to start doing yoga. And then I realized I've never had a, a good way of reducing stress. And if stress produces most of our symptoms, duh, why wouldn't right. I have some other way to deal with that? Yeah. And that's when yeah. I'll make a commitment to start meditating. And so here I made a commitment to myself. I couldn't move a centimeter in the bed, but I made a commitment as soon as I can get up and about. I'm going to go talk these issues out with those two people, work it mm -hmm. out in a real practical person-to-person -person way. I'm going to start I'm committed to do regular yoga and regular meditation. Within three or four days, maybe five days, I was back at work again. Wow. Two months later, I was skiing in Colorado. That's amazing. And, and then the more amazing part was about 10 years later, I was having, I'll have a, do, a routine physical every three or four years just to try mm -hmm. to go prove how healthy I am. Right. Not to look for what's wrong, but to find the proofs of the health, which helps my mental attitude. Mm -hmm. And so I went to the doctor, and he said, we need to take an X-ray of your chest. We haven't taken one of those in years. I said, well, I don't want the radiation. I know my lungs are healthy. He said, uh -huh. but we have new equipment. It's not a whole lot of radiation. And so I said, well, okay, I'll concede then. He took the X-rays, and he came back out stammering. He said, well, Henry, that, 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 that disc of yours. And I thought it was about to give me some horrible news. Mm-hmm. And then he said, it's a miracle. Then I knew it wasn't horrible. <laughs> and so he said, I said, well, what is it? He says, that, that disc is totally restored. That's not supposed to happen. Oh, I love that validation. And what wow. that validated for me is if I'm dealing with the problem that's creating my sickness, it does mm -hmm. not have to be manifested in my body any longer. Yeah. But as long as I have a need for it in some way that's not fully conscious to me and I've not dealt with it differently, then it's, the symptom will persist. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to have to go to a quick break, but when we return, Henry, I'm going to want you to share with our listeners some of the questions we need to ask ourselves when facing these issues and what, what, what some of the um, physical symptoms can be saying about our past and what needs to be healed. More with Dr. Henry Grayson when we return here in just a few moments. What is a brilliant culture, and how do we create them? Why are they important? Claudette Rowley has created a breakthrough five-step process to help you design a culture that is authentic, innovative, and successful. Learn how to create change with Cultural Brilliance Radio, the DNA of organizational excellence, and Claudette Rowley. To learn more or work with Claudette, visit ClaudetteRowley.com. Brand consultant Jen Morgan is here with Radically Distinct Radio to help you take control of your future and maximize your brand's power to produce results. Whether you're an individual trying to reinvent yourself and launch a new venture, or you're an executive trying to reposition your company to modernize your sales and marketing programs, Jen Morgan and the Rad Method empower you to play to your strengths and show up in the world as your most powerful brand. To learn more, go to jenmorgan.com, that's Jen with two N's, morgan.com, or call 206 972 5366. 
On the cutting edge of the new mainstream, Christine Upchurch is passionate about bringing together science, psychology, and spirituality in a way that can be applied to our everyday lives for true transformation. The Christine Upchurch Show, stellar conversations to illuminate your journey, engages some of the most outstanding visionaries on the planet in lively dialogue to inspire you to become that bright light you're meant to be. Join Christine every Friday at 11 a.m. Pacific Time on KKNW, AM 1150, and Transformations talk radio gifted intuitive healer and spiritual teacher sarah luce brings her unique style to the hit show small steps big breakthrough radio on transformation talk radio.com tune in each month as sarah turns reality on end and shows us how to experience expansive results with simple yet powerful steps Expect an enlightening bend on what you currently believe is possible. For show details and upcoming topics, visit saraloose.com. That's S-A-R-A-L-O-O-S dot com. I'm Christine Upchurch, and this is a Stellar Reflections Minute. Years ago when facing cancer, without any immediate treatment options, I sought healing by making various life changes. For a while, I followed a very restrictive diet. I often found myself obsessing about which foods were good and which ones were bad. Then one day I realized I was consuming foods based on fear, fear of not getting well. But I didn't want to make choices out of fear anymore. I decided it was far better for my immune system if I allowed myself to experience the joy that came from, say, eating frozen yogurt, than it was for me to ingest the fear that came from avoiding it. Now, instead of choosing healthy habits based on fear, I try to make choices because they feel right and ultimately bring me joy and ease. How many of your healthy habits are really based on fear? Please visit StellarReflections.com or call 425-999-9836. That's 425-999-9836. Welcome back to the Christine Eptrich Show here on KKNW and Transformation Talk Radio. Talking today to Dr. Henry Grayson. And you know what, Henry, you've got a lot of insight about um, the things that can be getting in the way psychologically that are actually affecting us physically. So when we've got some sort of physical issue, whether it's something that's long-term and chronic or, you know, something that is more of a crisis or in-the-moment kind of thing, what sort of approach can we take to begin to explore it? Well, I think there's a bunch of questions I ask myself, and I'll get to those in a moment, but I think there's an underlying piece that's important for us to see because the New England Journal of Medicine stated back maybe almost 20 years ago that stress was related to 80 or more percent of our, our illnesses that we take to, go to take to doctors. Uh-huh. That's a high percentage. That's a high percentage. And we think about that, we think of stress, or doctors would say, you've been under stress lately, let me give you a pill. But that doesn't mm. count to what stress is about. It right. just te- temporarily masks it. And so what I've realized, if stress is the cause of most illnesses, then we need to get to the cause of the stress. Mm-hmm. What is it that's producing that stress? And then we have to look even further because we say one event somebody can experience, they're having fun with it. The other person experiences the same thing, and they're stressed by it. Mm-hmm. And then so many people think that when they're experiencing the stress, they're just a, a victim to it. But what you're saying is exactly. that different people respond differently to the same kind of stress. Right. People respond differently to everything. So we give everything our own individual meaning. We actually see through eyes of the past. And what we had in our past is relevant to this, too, because that colors how we see, hear, and interpret everything that happens to us. Mm-hmm. Because it's all programmed in from way, way back. And so... This set of questions kind of helps us get to a lot of that, you know. And so I have the overarching question that I I think is important is why might I need it? Because I realize if I don't get to why I need the symptom, it is going to persist. And that's been my experience for many decades. I I think, Henry, that there are a lot of people who resist doing that because they don't want to feel self-blame. Like that is a good point to make because that's what the ego mind and all of us would want us to do instead of saying, oh, yay, I found it. Now I can deal with it. I'm be healthy. Mm-hmm. The ego mind wants us then to blame ourselves for having done it. Yeah. And that's the thing that we all have to catch because there's never a need for self-blame here. It's like if you had some radioactive material in your closet in your house and uh-huh. you realized it was there but you can't find it. When you uh-huh. finally find it, you don't get upset. 
you find, oh boy, I rejoice, I found it, I can get it out of here now. Yeah, I love that analogy. That's the way we need to think about symptoms in our bodies. If I can get to what the cause is and learn another way of dealing with it, I can most likely be free of it. And so I, there's no need to blame myself yes. because that's the same part of my mind that would want to make me self, be sick anyway. And if I right. blame myself, then I'm going to feel guilty. And what does guilt demand but punishment? And uh-huh. then I'm going to punish myself in my body. And so guilt is a major form of creating illness. Oh, so that's, that's the key part. I'm so glad you brought this thing up about how people would tend to blame themselves. Because right. that's the thing we have. When we ask these questions, we've got to really be alert to make sure we don't start self-blame. Uh-huh. But, but instead, we, we're just discovering the treasure or the treasure of the answer uh, so right. we can get rid of it and be healthier and happier. Okay. So, but the, the questions under this world of why might I need it is what would it get for me, as I said before? Mm-hmm. What would it get me out of doing? Uh-huh. Uh, uh, is, what emotion is expressed in it? Am I been dealing with anger or guilt or shame or fear or worry or whatever it is? Have I been mm-hmm. dwelling on those emotions and just hashing them out in my mind, thinking them through the day, having them wake me up at night, you know, worrying about this, projecting into the future, bemoaning the past, all of that sort of stuff? That's the emotion. And mm-hmm. then if I realize, is there some metaphor being expressed in it? That's uh, another good question, like is somebody a pain in the neck? Uh-huh. Effort back breaking, or there's something I don't want to see, or I don't want to hear, or some right. fear of moving forward that might be affecting my legs or my knees or whatever. You know, you can see that there are metaphors in a variety of ways that can take place in the body. Uh-huh. And so, even use that in our language and these symptoms, these uh, phrases we use. And right. then so another one would be is there some trauma that I've not cleared? Mm-hmm. Well, we know now in the research that if you had significant childhood traumas, early childhood traumas, and right. nurturing, of missing a lot, not consistent, a lot of judgment, a lot of abandonment. That's much higher incidence of a serious illness in early adult life. High correlation between those two. We know, too, that if we have a trauma in the present, whether it's a little one or a big one, mm-hmm. if we've not dealt with it and had a way of releasing it, we're likely to get a symptom even in a couple of days. Mm-hmm. One. We might even get a bigger one within a few months or a few weeks. Yeah. So we need to have some other way of dealing with traumas. And then, of course, out of our painful experiences of traumas, uh, then we draw conclusions, don't we? Oh, and absolutely. Those conclusions become what I would call negative belief systems. Mm-hmm. Okay, I, I will be rejected because I was rejected before. I'll be criticized if I show myself like I was criticized as a child, you know, and uh-huh. so on and it goes. And so I'll draw a conclusion, I'm not worthy, or I'm no good, or I can't accomplish this, or I'll be a failure, or mm-hmm. nobody will like me, or, you know, we can go on and on with those beliefs. And if we don't tend to that differently, yes, that can reduce the symptom. Right. And so then we have not only then the be- traumas and the beliefs, but then we have an issue we call I call downloads. Mm-hmm. Because if you think about it, as little kids, we all just download from our parents what's there. That's the way we learn to walk. That's the way we learn to talk, and we learn the way to communicate or not communicate, to be present, not be present. Uh, One story I read recently just made it so vivid for me. I read a story about a German Shepherd dog that was pregnant, running across the road. She got Uh hit by a car. Oh, dear. Uh, But she escaped with her life, and she was running fast, fortunately, and the car ran over her hind legs and broke them. Oh. And they couldn't be repaired. But the babies weren't damaged. And so when they were born a few weeks later, then they started to walk. But guess how those puppies learned to walk? Oh. As you can imagine, they walked dragging their hind legs behind them like their mother did, even though their legs were perfectly healthy. That is fascinating, Henry. Oh, my goodness. And I goodness. thought that story says it all for us, how much we download automatically from mother or from father or some other caretaker, and we download the positive stuff we like, which we want to keep, but we all downloaded some negative stuff, too, yeah. which affects our whole lives and our functioning and especially our health. It gets tricky, though, Henry, because belief systems are exactly that. They're this structure that we think are, you know, it creates truth. But if it's just something that is a belief and not the truth, then, then how do we kind of, you know, delve our way into undercut, you know, uncovering what the truth truly is? 
But I find if I can ask myself these questions with a genuine curiosity Mm -hmm. about them and not want to limit myself to anything because I'm afraid to get it, that I can get the answer. But sometimes I I can get it quickly. Sometimes it takes me a few hours. Once it took me two or three years to get to the answer to something. Uh But the key is persisting our curiosity to get the answer to which one of those questions. The one Mm -hmm. thing I find helpful uh, you're probably familiar with uh, applied kinesiology and muscle testing. Oh, oh you bet. Because uh, it's not as useful to do on oneself by oneself, though sometimes it is, but we can often deceive ourselves. Like Frederick Nietzsche, that famous philosopher, back uh-huh. in the, over a century ago, says, a person we lie to most is ourselves. Well, why is that? <laughs> because 95% of all of our behaviors are not conscious. Uh-huh. And that doesn't make us bad people. That co- cooperates all the good stuff, too. That, you don't think right. uh, every single syllable you formulate in your mouth and what words you're using. When you've got a brand new language, you do. But mm-hmm. speaking like we are now, we've not thought for a moment about how to formulate our words, have we? Right. That's right. unconscious speaking. So that's the good news. But the <clears throat> bad news is we have that negative stuff, too. Yeah. And we can lie to ourselves about it. But if our symptoms are persisting, the chances are I'm still being untrue with myself or re- not recognizing the truth. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Some part very, of that unconscious powerful. part I've not gotten to yet. And again, mm-hmm. that's never to blame myself or to blame mm-hmm. somebody else for it, but it just means I still need to be curious. I know, Henry, that you, in your book you have uh, many, many tools to help us to both explore the underlying belief system and the, the, the un, you know, unattended issues, but also to help to heal them. Um, We have to go to another quick break, but more about your power to heal with Dr. Henry Grayson in just a few moments. Chris Stainis is a spiritual leader and healer and teaches a course on how you can transform your life through a meditation and healing system that will manifest your spirit's dreams. She manifested the Women of Wisdom Conference, the Women of Wisdom book, and this radio show. And she can show you how to change your life, too. Are you ready? Visit the website and contact her at VoicesOfWomenToday.com. That's VoicesOfWomenToday.com. Be unstoppable. Who do executive women count on for up-to-date information on everything from stilettos to being heard in the boardroom? To achieve excellence, you must first take control of your life and develop a successful strategy with the Unstoppable Diva. Tune in to Up or Out with Connie Fife, Mondays, 5 p.m. Eastern, as she cuts through the BS to guide you to become bold, connected, and unstoppable. For more information, visit uporout.com. On the cutting edge of the new mainstream, Christine Upchurch is passionate about bringing together science, psychology, and spirituality in a way that can be applied to our everyday lives for true transformation. The Christine Upchurch Show, stellar conversations to illuminate your journey, engage some of the most outstanding visionaries on the planet in lively dialogue to inspire you to become that bright light you're meant to be. Join Christine every Friday at 11 a.m. Pacific Time on KKNW, AM 1150, and Transformation Talk Radio. Are you ready to stop stress, anxiety, and low self-esteem from running your life? Join award-winning author Dr. Friedemann Schaub for Empowerment Radio and learn breakthrough solutions to switch out of survival mode and approach every day with great ease, joy, and purpose. Tune in the first and third Wednesday at 11 a.m. Pacific to Empowerment Radio with host Dr. Friedemann Schaub on Transformation Talk Radio. Visit the fearandanxietysolution.com to learn more. This is Peggy Snow, practitioner at Stellar Reflections with a Stellar Reflections Minute. So many people these days are trying to find ways to relieve their stress. What happens to our breathing when we're feeling overwhelmed and stressed? When we tune in, we realize that we're either holding our breath or taking very shallow breath. To signal the body that all is well, which most of the time it is, sometimes all that is needed is a nice, deep breath to break the cycle. First, exhale to get all the stale air out by engaging the abdominal muscles and blowing gently. Next, take a nice full breath in, feeling it fill your body all the way down to your hips. Release fully and enjoy the freedom of movement. Notice how your body feels. Do you feel refreshed? 
Calmness is only a breath away. This has been a Stellar Reflections Minute. For more information about what we offer at Stellar Reflections, visit us at StellarReflections.com or call 425-999-9836. That's 425-999-9836. Welcome back to the Christine Epture Show here on KKNW, WBLQ, and Transformation Talk Radio. Today I am chatting with Dr. Henry Grayson. He's a psychologist who is an expert at helping us to explore what the issues are psychologically and emotionally that are triggering our physical symptoms. And um, it, it's a fabulous book called Your Power to Heal. Now, Henry, I, I know people are listening, and we've talked a little bit about the book, and we've, we've talked about um, some of the, about the process. Before we go any further, can you play, please share with our listeners how they can connect with you online? Uh, my, my website is just uh, henrygrayson.com. Okay, that's H-E-N-R-Y-G-R-A-Y-S-O-N. Yeah, yeah. And I know that you teach courses, and um, I think you're teaching one this weekend, and, um, you know, and I'm sure you, I know you get links to your book as well. So, Henry, okay, before the break, you started talking about how we can sort of physically, through muscle testing, um, kinesiology, sort of a, a assess, like, what might be triggering a physical issue. Can you share with our listeners a little bit more details about what that is and how we might go about kind of asking questions using that approach? Sure, <clears throat> because one thing about the muscle testing, it's used differently by chiropractors and nutritionists or whatever, but a simple explanation that we can use, simply the person holds out their arm and resists you pushing it down, and then they have them make a statement that you absolutely know to be true, it's like, uh-huh. my name is Henry versus my name is Tom. Uh-huh. But my arm will go strong if they press on it if I say Henry. If I say my name is Tom, which it's not, my arm would just flop down like it's, I, I wasn't even resisting, even though I was. Right. So what we know from that is if, uh, if we both join our minds in the search for truth, that then we'll join our energy, not trying to prove I'm right or wrong or you're right or wrong, but uh-huh. just we want the truth. That's when that muscle testing is going to be more accurate. Mm-hmm. And so the arm goes strong when we know from our inner wisdom a statement to be true. Mm-hmm. So if, if, for example, uh, you and I were chatting during our break here about uh, genetic memories and how they can contribute, and we've all were, were taught in school, you have, once you have a gene, you know, you're locked in it. You're, you're kind of doomed for life. Sure. But the new field of epigenetics is that which is above the genes, the new science, says no, genes are activated or deactivated by the environment. And the environment, right. not only is the environment, physical environment, but consciousness, too. Uh-huh. So realize that. <clears throat> we can play a role in deactivating genetic em- uh, memories, right. the, the DNA. And so, so, uh, so are the genetic works. memories just things like um, a propensity for a certain kind of cancer, or does it go beyond that, Henry? Well, it could be a whole range of things, I guess. It could be uh, one that will make me perceive everything fearfully, because uh, uh, it could be because... My parents were living out in the Midwest or in the West in the olden days where the Indians were coming in and burning down houses and whatever and shooting, catching. So they could be in, or you lived in Russia through, you know, a couple of decades ago where they were really, everybody was terrified because people were being hauled off and killed and they didn't yeah. know where their relatives went. Okay, we get those genes, we can bring with us unnecessary predisposition toward fear uh-huh. you know, and worry. Our actual, and and, and you know, there's actually our, been some scientific studies that have, validated this, haven't there, Henry? Yeah. And the way I got to it was a simply a simple thing there, too. I was working with a patient who'd been anxious, and I, I'd learned most of the different forms of psychotherapy for dealing with that. I always looked mm-hmm. for the one that would work best. Nothing was working. And one day she came in saying, Henry, I think I was born with this. Huh. And I said, well, let's check it out and see. And I'd never uh-huh. done this before. But I asked her to extend the arm. Uh, I got brought this from some ancestor with me. Her arm got really strong. Uh, mm-hmm. It did not come from there. Resist. 
It just uh-huh. locked right down. I thought, wow, we're onto something here. Right. And I asked them, there's just one genetic memory. No, it's two genetic memories. No, it was three. And we got strong on that. So there were three pieces of DNA information that were affecting that. And I thought, well, what the heck do we do with that? Right. And that was back in the 90s. And I just learned one of the methods, the first method of energy psychology called thought field therapy. What was it called? called? Thought field therapy. Right. And that came about a psychologist out in California uh, back in the early 90s, I think it was. He'd studied uh, acupuncture and saw benefits of it. And he felt we can't stick needles in people as psychologists. He discovered if he tapped on the acupressure points or touched them and massaged them, you could stimulate them. And so he thought, okay, let me try that. So he came up with things for clearing traumas and clearing uh, beliefs and so on. Uh, And I picked the one for trauma, and I thought, let me just try this with her and see if it works. Mm -hmm. There were about five different alternatives I could have used, but I used one that covered all the acupressure points to do with fear or worry or anxiety. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, nothing to lose. There's no harmful side effects here, like many medications. So I tried that with her, and we did some clearing on it. I was away for a conference the next week. I came back in two weeks. She comes Mm -hmm. back just glowing. She said, for the first time in my life, I've been free of anxiety. Wow. I thought, wow. She just taught me a real important lesson. Yeah. That she got to what it was about. She thought it put, she planted the seed in my head, but she thought she was born with it. Mm-hmm. And so, and I took my chances to see if with a conscious intent and using meridian stimulation work, that it would work, and indeed it did. And so that started a whole trend of me thinking and exploring. Mm-hmm which I still want to continue to explore. But the other ways to access this information, I have in the book there a self-awareness questionnaire that if people will go through that self-awareness questionnaire, it helps you pinpoint your thinking and raise questions you wouldn't have thought about before. Mm -hmm. Your traumas that you've had, belief systems you might have developed, and... uh, and, and these go and what they might well be, beyond... and then, it all, then also yeah. there in, in the book there's two other checklists: mm-hmm. one to help identify traumas for clearing, another one mm-hmm. to help identify negative beliefs. Because if we can go through a whole long list of possible ones, oh, yeah, that is true for me. I wouldn't have even thought about it if I hadn't seen it written down here. Uh huh. Yeah. And so those are ways, uh, three more ways we can access, you know, beliefs that are behind the symptom, or. Mm-hmm. Uh, traumas that are there, early developmental traumas, or maybe even early ones that are not remembered. <laughs> developmental theories say we form our personalities by age five, but mm-hmm. how many of us remember much from that? Yeah, not I mean, much. I remember three or four things prior to age five. Mm-hmm. That's it. But yet, if I wrote my operating system for my life then, you know, something's got to be there. Mm-hmm. Now, I was just working with somebody last week who was thinking about what her mother was experiencing when she was in the uterus. The marriage uh-huh. broke up, and she was upset, and all that sort of thing. And uh-huh. we're seeing how much that probably related to symptoms she's carrying now. Interesting. So you know, those are other ways we can access that unconscious part of our minds, that 95% of our minds. And I know that um, I have seen numerous questionnaires over the years in, in books um, and online, and yours is probably the most thorough, or your series of questionnaires. I mean, there are literally hundreds of questions we can ask ourselves, um, which, you know, I find fascinating. It's, it's in much greater detail than I've ever seen before, and I think that there's a lot of power in that. Well, we, we tend to not want to see the, the very thing we need to see. For example, one thing oh, that will happen is if I'm about ready, say I'm talking with a patient, and we ne- identified a negative belief. I don't deserve to be healthy or something, uh-huh. right. or I don't deserve success. We talk about it for a half hour. She'll bring her fingers, or he will bring his fingers up to the forehead, which is a place to have people to help focus more intently. Uh-huh. Think about the scene. And that person will sometimes say, Henry, what was that we were going to clear now? And this is a very <laughs> smart person. But the ego mind tells us that's the way the ego mind works. It wants uh-huh. us to hold on to the things that will make us feel bad and make us sick. Why and it wants that? us to not remember them, so not to find them or to clear them. What what stake does the ego have in keeping us stuck? I think the bottom line piece is 
it makes us live in the illusion that we're all separate. Oh. We're separate from each other. We're separate from the universe. We're separate from what people have called God. We're separate from that unified field, as the physicists call it. And the ego mind wants us to stay in that illusion. Okay. <laughs> because that if we stay sense. in that illusion, we're separate from the source of power. Mm-hmm. We think we're limited by just that little piece of our minds that thinks it uh, doesn't have very much. Now's a good time to go to a break. More about this fascinating subject and about how to shift your beliefs and clear that energy that's trapped so that you can heal. Uh, more with Dr. Henry Grace in just a few moments. Tune in to Dynamics of Diversity Radio, scripting the new narrative for immigration with leading experts, Kripa Upadya and Steve Tanijo on TransformationTalkRadio.com. This show will remove the noise that often accompanies discussions on this topic and share a new perspective on the dynamics of immigration and diversity, ever reminding us that together we are all at the core of innovation, excellence, and positive change. Visit OrbitLawPLLC.com for upcoming topics. I'm Christy Nepchurch, and this is a Stellar Reflections Minute. For centuries, spiritual traditions have talked about how humans have an energy field, or aura, surrounding them. Although skeptical scientists refuted this for decades, science is now beginning to catch up with spirituality. Scientists can actually measure light emanating from living beings, so they can measure the human aura, which in scientific terms is known as the biofield. Many medical practitioners around the world use an instrument to evaluate a patient's biofield for the purpose of diagnosing illness. They understand that imbalanced or insufficient light in a person's energy field indicates a physical or emotional problem. The good news? There are ways to balance and increase your light, resulting in greater well-being. For more information, please check out StellarReflections.com or call 425-999-9836. That's 425-999-9836. What if your body and mind were the compasses to the secrets, mysteries, and magic of life? Glenna Rice, co-host of The Questionable Parent, is inviting you to access all that is possible. Glenna is a 10-year certified veteran access consciousness facilitator who offers an amazing variety of life-changing classes and workshops. Work with Glenna from anywhere with teleclasses and workshops all over the globe. To learn more and see Glenna's current schedule of events, classes, and workshops, visit GlennaRice.com. Have you been seeing numbers like 111 and 222 everywhere you go? Do you feel that the universe may be trying to get your attention, perhaps offering a message of some sort? As it turns out, numerical patterns and certain types of geometry form the very fabric of our reality, from cells under a microscope to the astronomy of our night sky. At Stellar Reflections, we offer special sessions which tap into these patterns, designed specifically to support you on your journey. The 111 and 222 activations are sessions activating new patterns in your energy field, which in turn can help you create new patterns in your life. After just one session with a practitioner, either in person or via distance, clients report gaining greater clarity, becoming more intuitive, and honoring their inner truth as they move forward in their lives. Curious about what these transformational sessions might do for you? Call 425-999-9836 or visit StellarReflections.com. That's StellarReflections.com. Welcome back to the Chris Hampshire Show here on KKNW and Transformation Talk Radio. Boy, this hour is flying by, Henry, and um, this is such a fascinating and in-depth topic. I know there's so much more to cover, and and for those of you who are listening, who are intrigued by this, who have something you want to heal, I highly recommend this book. It's called Your Power to Heal, Resolving Psychological Barriers to Your Physical Health. Henry, uh, you talk a lot about thoughts in your book. What is it we should know about our thoughts? 
and their power over us. I think the first thing is to recognize there's no such thing as a private thought. Oh. That's a big self-deception. Why? Because all our thoughts, as the physicists put it, are just part of one unified field. Mm -hmm. As that Nobel Prize winning physicist Erwin Schrodinger put it, the number of minds I've been able to observe in the universe is one, he said. And mm -hmm. another one, uh, uh, and the, uh, John Wheeler, the eminent physicist, when he was at Princeton, said, could it be we bring the whole universe into existence through our consciousness? Mm. The key act is our participation. Well, these things that this current theory and, and the new science of quantum physics, uh, different from the old science of Isaac Newton 350 years ago, which is where most of us think and live, mm -hmm. but the new science, we have a lot more power. And it's very similar to worldwide ancient spiritual wisdom as well. Uh -huh. Like 2,600 years ago, the Buddha said, you are what you think with your thoughts, you make your world. Mm -hmm. Or if you go back into the Jewish and Christian tradition, to the creation myth, and it says, and God said, let there be this, let there be light, let there be firmament, let there be water, and so on. Mm -hmm. Then he concludes by saying, and he created man in his own image and likeness. Now, this is not often taught in Christianity or Judaism. Uh -huh. That God created us to be the creators in the same way that God is. We're one mm -hmm. of the same, we have the same essence, the same right. substance. It's not as some old jealous guy up in the sky. Yeah. We're a part of that intelligent force of the universe. Well, you know, and Henry, our it... thoughts are ones that are going out in the act of creation. So every thought, I'm creating something with it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Henry, so I it's... need to be very careful about which thoughts I allow to linger in my mind. Right. It's frightening. It's frightening that our thoughts can have that kind of power, not only over our own lives, but on others as well, if, we've, if they're going out into this unified field. That's right. Because when you have mounds of research now that show how thoughts affect plants, how mm -hmm. thoughts affect animals, how thoughts affect others. Right. And uh, uh, much research shows that. So the, the mind is non-local, as a physicist would put it. Mm -hmm. It's out there reaching out and connecting with everybody and everything. Right. And so uh, those of us who've given more emphasis to it can see that how that takes place, even around us. So that's a very important part for us to deal with. No question about it. So how do we deal with our, our thoughts if they're um, really destructive in one way or another? Well, one thing I like to do is a very simple little exercise that I call the thymus heart rub. <laughs> if okay. you bring your hand up to the upper chest, flat on the chest, uh -huh. and then rub it around in a soothing way. Because we don't have many things in our culture where we can do self-soothing that are healthy. We uh -huh. rely on addictions of drugs or TV or uh, whatever, just and work, and we have our addictions, but they aren't right. soothing. They're unhealthy forms. Yeah. So if we can do this, you can feel it soothing as you rub your upper chest. And then just say the words, I deeply love and accept myself even though I'm feeling whatever it is or thinking. Mm -hmm. And so what we can do is if I'm going along and suddenly I realize, no, I'm not happy right now, I'm feeling sad or I'm feeling anxious or I'm worried or I'm depressed, mm -hmm. I can ask myself the question, what was I just thinking? If I can ask myself at that point, then I can get to the thought that produced that feeling. And so then if I can see, oh, yeah, I'm still upset about that dialogue I just had with my boss, you know, uh -huh. there's angst about my work or that conflict I had with my wife over this happening or that. Mm -hmm. Okay, what, what I can do, bring my hand up at the chest and say something like this. I deeply love and accept myself because I'm so glad I caught that disturbing thought. I deeply love and accept myself because I'm glad I caught that enemy thought because that's not the voice of a friend to focus on. And right. I deeply love and accept myself as I choose to let that thought go now. Because I prefer to be happy and at peace and healthy right now. Uh huh. Just a simple thing like that. It takes about a minute to do or two. Right. That breaks into that thought pattern rather than snowballing down the hill. Mm -hmm. There was a wonderful quote I read years ago of that first yogi that came to America out in uh -huh. California. It was Yogananda. Yes. And he made a statement that's always stayed with me. He says, I never allow any thought to linger in my mind without my express permission. He didn't say, I can keep it out of my mind. Oh. Because the thoughts will always come into our mind. Our ego thoughts will come in relentlessly. And the, mm -hmm. many of them are disturbing and negative. But 
Okay. I'm in charge of whether they linger and how long they linger. Yeah. And if and, I and, use this tool, that's one way of breaking into keeping them from lingering. Mm-hmm. But and one of the things I, I love about that tool. Sorry. One of the things I love about that tool is it. Um, you're allowing it to be. So you're not trying to push it away. You're not judging it. It's kind of it's this total acceptance of how you feel in order to let it go. I accept it, and then I choose to let it go. Mm-hmm. I love and accept myself because I'm so glad I caught it. <laughs> yeah. I don't yeah. want to judge myself and punish myself for having it. But I'm just going to choose to let it go because who wants to sit on a tack if they see where one is that they're sitting on? <laughs> I love that analogy. Yes. <laughs> and, and if I'm doing I've that with my thoughts, tracks. if I'm doing the equivalent of sitting on a tack, why wouldn't I want to let it go? Although there's that brilliant uh, insight from that Russian philosopher, Gurdjieff. He makes the most okay. amazing statement about us as humans. He says, you can call on human beings to give up almost any pleasure or to make noble sacrifices for almost any worthy cause, uh-huh. but just don't ask them to give up their suffering. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, love that. to it. That's why the American Heart Association says only five percent of Americans will do what they know to do to keep a healthy heart. Or people who go and study meditation, only ten percent will continue to practice it after a few months. Mm-hmm. Or people say, "I'm going to go exercise," they stop. Right. How many people do that? That's the part of us. That's the egoic mind that wants us to stay in pain and in suffering and in sickness. Yeah. And we yeah. all have that voice to deal with. It's not to punish, to punish ourselves for it. It just needs, we need to recognize the difference between the voice of a friend and the voice of an enemy. So, Henry, what are the consequences if we let go of the suffering? What, what, what might we be afraid of? That's a good question. Sometimes I think we're afraid of feeling good. Sometimes we're afraid of success. Sometimes we're afraid of happiness. We get so attached to something. If we had a childhood where there's a lot of pain and suffering, or a lot of uh-huh. criticism, or a lot of judgment, or a lot of rejection, we attract the very same thing that we hated. Like the classic example of the girl who was beaten up by a father will often marry a guy who will beat her up. Sure. Then she'll divorce him and find another one who will beat her up. Right. And we do that about smaller things all the time. We're attracted to somebody that has qualities that are familiar to us, positive and negative. Uh-huh. And until we identify those, that's why we need to identify the things that we grew up with, the downloads from our parents, the beliefs uh-huh. or traumas we experienced then. Then we need to do the processes to clear those out. And there are several of those that I outline in the book, Your Power to Heal, that we can use uh-huh. on ourselves. And if we do those processes on ourselves, we can release that trauma. We can release that, release that negative belief. Then we can flip it over and install new software with positive belief in its place. Then that, those are the thoughts that come up more adequately. Uh, spontaneously and automatically then instead of the old ones. Mm-hmm. And if we can change those patterns inside, then we have a lot more health, happiness, success, and so on. And joy, all of those wonderful things. Mm-hmm. So if we get ourselves to that point, can the ego continue to play a role? The ego will always be speaking up as long as we're here in the body. Mm-hmm. Our job is just to recognize it, see it for what it is, and let it go. Because uh, if you think about it, in the Vietnamese War, we had the highest rate of combat neurosis of any war in American history. Mm-hmm. Why? Because half the time, or more than half the time, the soldiers did not know who the enemy was. The North right. Vietnamese had uniforms, but the Viet Cong had no uniforms. Civilians could have hand grenades that they'd throw. It could be a mother with a baby in arms, or a grandmother, or a 10-year-old kid. To throw right. into the jeep and blow them up. And if we know, don't know the enemy thought in our mind, it makes us disturb the same way it did those soldiers. Yeah. We have so, run out of time, Henry. Um, fabulous book, fabulous interview. Thank you so much for joining us here today. And uh, your website, again, is henrygrayson.com. Thanks, Henry. Thank you. Good to be with you. And thank you for joining us here today. I look forward to talking to you again soon. You've been listening to The Christine Upchurch Show, stellar conversations to illuminate your journey. 
Each week, this show engages some of the most outstanding visionaries on the planet in lively dialogue to inspire you to become that bright light you're meant to be. Join Christine every Friday at 11 a.m. Pacific Time on KKNW, AM 1150, and TransformationTalkRadio.com. For more information about the transformative healing work of Christine, visit www.StellarReflections.com. And for weekly topics, visit www.TransformationTalkRadio.com. 